John Brennan Crutchley was the worst of the worst. He was a convicted kidnapper and rapist who was suspected of murdering more than 30 women but was never tried nor convicted of these crimes. And what he did to his victims was unimaginable. He would drain their blood to the point of near death whilst he would repeatedly sexually assault them. And for this, he got the name of the vampire rapist. John Critchley was born the youngest of three siblings. He was born on the 1st of October 1946. According to John, his mother was distraught by the death of her oldest daughter, Donna. Donna died during emergency surgery just a year before John was born. She was just 14 years old at the time of her death and her death was listed as circulatory collapse. I hope I said that right. When John was born, his mother was so disappointed. She wanted another girl, like her daughter Donna. So for the first six years of John's life, she just ignored that he was a boy. She would dress him in dresses and act like he was a girl, and he had no say in this for the first six years of his life. In addition to this, John said that his parents were severely abusive. They would beat him to the point of unconsciousness and burn his fingers, which is so awful. And I don't think any child would be able to recover from this sort of childhood. Or you would need a lot of therapy and a lot of emotional support as you got older. John Critchley, from early on, was a very lonely child. He didn't really have any friends. So instead of playing out and going to see his friends, he would be alone in his basement and play around with electronics and fix them and things like that. He found peace in doing this and it occupied his time instead of having friends. And he was also building his knowledge on how to work complex systems. As John got older, he attended university. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics in Ohio, 1970. He then went on to do engineering and graduated that with a master's degree in Washington. This was a big deal for John. It was the start of him going into the adult world, but he'd already dabbled in that. John was married. He got married in 1969 before he even graduated at just 23 years old. But John's first marriage showed cracks within the first year. It was very short-lived. John wanted to move to Kokomo in Indiana and I don't think his wife particularly wanted to move. And the way their marriage was going, I don't think long distance was going to work. So they divorced. John worked in Indiana for some time. He got a job at the Dalco Electronics Corporation where he worked as an electronic systems engineer which is really full circle because it was very similar to what he did in the basement as a child, obviously just on a, a larger scale now. His departure from Kokomo came after an investigation started at his work. There was a lot of missing materials and there was nothing to ever say it was John, but it was just a bit suspicious he left the whole state as soon as this investigation launched. John left Kokomo and he started a new life in Fairfax County in Virginia and he really settled down here. He got married to his second wife and he had a baby. When John moved to Fairfax County, a lot of women started to go missing. And in 1977, a couple of years after John moved to Virginia, he started seeing another woman. It even got to the point of giving each other labels as boyfriend and girlfriend. And then, mysteriously, she disappeared. Her name was Deborah Fitzjohn, and she was just 25 years old. And the last time she was seen was at John's trailer park. John was the last person to ever see her alive. Of course, John was top suspect. He was questioned until he was blue in the face. And they believed it was him, but there was absolutely no evidence to point to this. And so, nothing come of it. And then the following year, her skeletal remains were found. Referring back to earlier, when we said a lot of strange and mysterious things happened whilst John was in Virginia, women's bodies were found in remote areas of the state. Two teenage girls were found. They are referred to as the Lionel sisters, and they were found in Wheaton. And then another girl was found. Her name was Kathy Betty, 
and she was a possible rape murder and she was found not far from the two teenage sisters. The three girls were found in Montgomery County which is not far from where John's wife's family lived and later in the case they try to connect these murders to John but there's just no evidence. So John started a new job in Washington DC and he worked for a lot of high-tech companies and he was around a lot of sensitive data, like highly confidential data. And just remember that because we will come back to that in the case. John was in high demand for work. He got a lot of job offers very frequently and at the minute he was working in Washington and living in Virginia and that's like three and a half hours apart, so it wasn't feasible. So in 1983, John and his wife and his son moved again, but this time to Florida. And of course, as soon as John moves, people start going missing in Florida. On the evening of the 22nd of November, 1985, two years after John had moved to Florida. A naked teenage girl, later identified as 19-year-old Laura Murphy, was found crawling along the roadside and handcuffed at her hands and her feet. Shockingly, she had been passed by several trucks. She was a naked woman crawling along the roadside, probably evidently in distress and they did not stop for her which I think is crazy. Like, they didn't even call the police, they literally just drove past and forgot it ever even happened. Eventually a motorist stopped for Laura and she begged him to not take her back to the house and he had no idea what she was talking about. She described a house to him and told him to please remember it. He noted the location down and took Laura home and she was in a terrible state. He called the ambulance and the police because it was evident that she had been brutally attacked. The hospital determined that she had lost between 40 and 45% of her blood and she had ligature marks over her neck. She said she had been hitchhiking the day before and a man pulled over and said that he will take her to where she needs to go, which is a nearby city in Melbourne, Florida, he said he just had to stop off at home because he needed a notebook for work and he couldn't do without it. Once in the driveway, the man invited her into the house and she was becoming increasingly suspicious and uncomfortable of the situation. She refused and said she will stay in the car, at which time he tied a ligature around her neck and strangled the teenager unconscious. When Laura awoke, she was naked, tied to his countertop. Her arms and legs were immobilised and a camera was pointing right at her. He then raped Laura and then inserted a needle into her arm and wrist and started extracting blood and drinking it right in front of her. He told Laura that he was a vampire. Afterward, he handcuffed her and took her into the bathtub. He then sexually assaulted her again later that day and extracted more of her blood. The following morning, after sexually assaulting her for the third time, he handcuffed her and left her in the bathroom. He said that he's going to return later that day for the fourth assault and that if she tried to escape, then his brother, who was in the next room, would kill her. But very bravely, Laura took that risk. He didn't know whether he was bluffing or whether there really was another man in the house but she very bravely climbed out the window and ran and that's where she ended up on the highway and the motorist had found her and she was in a terrible state. She had been terribly abused and so much blood had been extracted from her. The doctor said that if she had been left for another 12 hours, she would have died of blood loss. So fortunately, Laura had remembered John's house and she was able to show police where she endured the most horrific and traumatic thing in her life. Police were able to see that the house belonged to John Brennan Crutchley. A search warrant was served for John Brennan Crutchley whilst his wife and child were away for Thanksgiving. After they investigated the house, they were able to see that the camera had partially been erased, which according to Laura would have showed John raping her and extracting her blood. John was arrested during the this search which happened at 2.30 a.m. Two searches were done of the house. The first search showed a stack of credit cards which was several inches thick 
but then the second search did not show these credit cards. During the second search of the house, they found several of women's IDs. They also found a stack of women's necklaces, which were concealed in a separate closet. Now, John tried to say that these were his wife's, but police did not believe this. They believed these necklaces must have been special to John because they were kept separately. They believed they were kept as trophies, if not mementos of his killings. In the search, they also found a stack of cards and these cards had women's names written on them and their sexual performances. Well, the cards described their sexual performances. So the police called these women and they told police that they did in fact have sex with John but he crossed the line between consensual and non-consensual. They were okay with it being kinky and a bit BDSM-y but he crossed the line and he would make it so they were restrained and had no power at all. And you may be thinking, like me, where is his wife in all of these acts that he's doing? John's wife had substantial involvement in the sexual acts in which John committed. John's wife was described as his perfect mate and when it came out that he had done this horrific thing to the teenager, she described it as a gentle rape devoid of any overt brutality. Basically, she was just saying, meh, it's not that deep, like, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a gentle rape. Like, what the hell? Them two words do not go together. So when police contacted these women who had their names written on a card, and they were saying that he was crossing the line to the point where it was non-consensual, John's wife had actually been present in a lot of those interactions and it had been recorded for the whole duration. Investigators believed that John had almost definitely killed before. They believed him to be an organised serial killer. And that's when they looked at John's past and found that wherever he moved, suspiciously women would go missing. In particular, the one that they claimed to be boyfriend and girlfriend, John was the last to see. And they investigated them again and they could still not find any evidence to pinpoint John. But they strongly believed that he had killed these women. Which means that he had killed around four women if it was him. They believe he had killed before because he knew exactly when to strike and strangle the teenager. He knew how to withdraw the blood. And there had been reports from the girls who he had sexual encounters with previously. And they said that he always took it a step too far to the point where it was sadistic. And unconsensual. At the time of John's arrest he was in possession of a lot of highly classified papers. Not only that but John's job at the time at Harris Corporations was involved with a lot of highly confidential information about NASA launches and also to do with a lot of their facilities. So it's very high classified stuff and John had no business holding it and taking it home. Federal agencies were looking at opening a case against John but I think when all of this come out of what he had done, I don't know if there was much point. In June 1986, John took a plea bargain. He said that he would plead guilty for rape and kidnap in exchange for the GBH to be dropped. And the grievous bodily harm charge was for extracting Laura's blood. During the sentencing, of course, it came up as to why he extract and drank Laura's blood. And he said that he had been taught it by a nurse in the 1970s. He said that the nurse showed him this as part of a sexual ritual. That he could, he said that he shouldn't be charged with it because he didn't actually get to drink the blood. And it's not for lack of wanting to, it was because it turned solid before he got chance. And that because of this, he just couldn't get it down. His wife refused to take the stand. But she told reporters that her husband was not guilty, he was just a kinky sort of guy. And so, in June 1986, the vampire rapist, John Critchley, was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment. He served 10 years of his sentence 
and then was let out early on good behaviour, which should not be allowed. This man is evidently a danger to society. Why would you let him out on good behaviour? So he can behave normally, he's just choosing not to. That's why he committed all these horrific crimes. But with extreme difficulty, they let him into the community and he was free for a grand total of a day. He violated his probation by smoking weed and he denied this and he said that he didn't but he had since told a parole officer that he was smoking weed to try and relax himself before the hearing and the violation of his parole resulted in him being sentenced to life in prison under the three strikes law so he had been charged for rape and kidnap and his third one was for smoking marijuana and that was enough to sentence him for life. When John returned to prison, I'm not laughing because it's funny, I'm laughing because it's just so weird. So John was placed, I'm sorry, John was placed in solitary confinement after he was found to have 13 piercings on his genitals and this was not good, this was just not allowed in prison, you're not allowed to have piercings on your genitals. So he was sentenced to solitary confinement. And on March the 30th, 2002, John Critchley was found dead in prison. He was found dead in his cell with a plastic bag over his head and his cause of death was asphyxiation. And that is everything on this case. John Critchley was a horrible man. I am so glad he didn't get released into the community but it shocks me that that was going to be a thing. If he didn't smoke marijuana, he could be out there today, well maybe not today, I don't know if he'd be alive now anyway, but he would be out there just mingling with the community like he didn't rape and kidnap a little teenager whilst drinking her blood and recording the whole instance. They believed him to be a serial killer and he was just released into the community, that's insane. So the one good thing John did do in his life was smoke weed which got him back in prison and that is where, yeah, he died. And that is everything. This is video three of True Crime Week. I missed yesterday's, very unfortunately, so I'm gonna roll it on to Wednesday now. And yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye.